Hi, I'm Justin with Roland Professional AV, and welcome to this complete video manual for Roland's VR6 HD Direct Streaming AV Mixer. The VR6 HD has six HDMI inputs that are freely assignable to the switcher buttons and composition layers. There are also three HDMI outputs and LAN and USB streaming outputs. Now for audio, there are six XLR TRS combo inputs, and the faders can be assigned to any analog or digital source in the 28-channel audio mixer. The VR6 HD is an all-in-one solution that's loaded with features, so I'll walk you through everything that this switcher can do. But if you only need help with a particular feature or the firmware update, please use the chapters in the video description to jump to that section. This video features firmware version 1.11. Please note that the menu layouts and features may change with future updates. Starting with the top panel, there's a single row of buttons to switch between inputs, recall scene memory presets, and more. By default, the six buttons control the six HDMI inputs on the multi-view screen, but they're fully customizable. The currently selected input is lit red and appears in the program window on the multi-view. This is what your audience sees as your main video output. Above that are the mode buttons to change what the switcher buttons do. You can use them to select an alternate aux video output source, recall a scene memory, or run a macro which contains multiple commands. To the right of that are the controls for transitions and panel operation, which you can use to either cut, mix dissolve, or wipe from one input to another, as well as two split screen modes and operating the sequencer for events. Above that are the controls for the two picture-in-picture -picture windows and downstream keyer for graphics. The audio mixer on the left has controls for seven mono or stereo audio channels, which you can customize to include any source in any order you like. For example, if you want to use an audio mixer channel to control HDMI input 2's audio and mono, you can quickly reassign and configure it by pressing that channel setup button. Above the mixer are the level knobs for the aux audio output buses, the streaming and recording levels, three audio effects, which can be customized, and six pads to play imported music and sound effects. To the right is an LCD screen multi-view in the menu controls. The monitor buttons let you change what you see on the LCD screen and can be customized in the system menu. Some monitor modes can also be assigned to video outputs. And finally, the output fade button by default fades out the audio and video, but you can customize this in the system menu. On the back panel, from right to left, are six HDMI inputs. By default, they appear as video 1 through 6 on the multi-view. If you later customize the multi-view, you can still assign inputs and still images to the picture-in-picture -picture and downstream key composition layers, even if they're not visible on the multi-view. All six HDMI inputs have scalers, which are flexible with older equipment that does not output HD video. Another advantage to scalers is they resize and reposition the source, which, for example, can be helpful if you want to hide the taskbar from a laptop. The three HDMI, LAN, and USB streaming outputs can be customized to output program, aux, multi-view, and more, giving you flexibility in reducing the need for signal converters, as multiple outputs can share the same video bus. Note that when you open the menu, it'll appear only on the LCD screen. Next to the USB streaming output is the LAN port for streaming directly without a computer, as well as connecting compatible PTZ cameras and third-party control systems. Along the top are six XLR TRS combo inputs that support both microphone and line level signals. There's an additional stereo RCA line input, and although all video and streaming outputs have embedded audio, there are also XLR and RCA outputs for connecting speakers and recorders. The quarter inch CTL EXP inputs are not for audio. They're actually for foot switch control. If you connect a compatible Boss foot switch, you can set it up to control the VR6 HD. The tally port is for connecting a compatible tally light system, as well as eight general purpose inputs for customized control. There's also an RS-232 port for connecting to third-party control systems, if you do not plan to use the LAN port for that. And the power supply is the PSB14U. If you need a replacement, please contact your dealer or visit roland.com backstage and submit a parts request. On the front side panel, the USB host and SD card ports are used to import still images and video clips, as well as back up your settings. The USB host port is also used for firmware updates, and you can record directly to an SD card. And finally, there's an eighth inch output for headphones with a volume knob. To open the main menu, press the menu button and use the value knob to highlight a submenu and push the knob to enter it. You can also tap it with your finger. Once you get to a setting you want to adjust, push the knob to highlight the value. If the setting is a number or a list, rotate the value knob to adjust it and push the knob again to confirm your selection. And a trick to adjust the number settings faster is to hold down the knob while twisting it. Tapping the return arrow or pressing the exit button will go up one menu level, while pressing the menu button will exit it completely. 
If there is a feature you use a lot, you can assign it to a user button on the LCD screen to quickly access it. To do this, open the dashboard menu and change LCD Assign A and B to either User Button 1 and 2 or 3 and 4. Note that the LCD and HDMI multi-view output have separate dashboard settings. When you connect video sources to the VR6 HD's inputs, they will quickly appear if assigned to the multi-view. Because they have scalers, your HDMI sources don't need to have the same resolution as the system format setting, which is in the system menu. But it is a good idea to match it if possible. By default, this is 1080p resolution. That means your sources can be either 1080i or 1080p. If your source is 480p or 720p, the scaler will resize it to 1080p. If you need the VR6 HD to instead output 720p, just change the system format setting. The VR6 HD will automatically convert frame rates, so your sources can be a mix of anything between 23.98 and 60Hz. The default output frame rate is 59.94Hz or 50Hz, depending on your country's video standard. Note that all HDMI outputs match the system format and frame rate settings, with the option to choose between 1080i and 1080p for each output individually when the system format is also 1080. The LAN and USB streaming outputs can be independently set to 1080p or 720p, with the option to cut the frame rate in half if the system frame rate is higher than 30Hz. In the Video Assign menu, you can customize the video inputs and outputs. Inputs 1 through 6 are the video switcher channels and can be any video input, still image, or the video clip player, making it fully customizable. For each of the five video outputs, you can assign them to any of six buses, and as we mentioned earlier, more than one output can be assigned to the same bus. Program and subprogram are what your audience sees. It is the selected input plus transitions and composition layers. The AUX bus is independently switchable from program. This can be helpful if you want to send a PowerPoint to in-house displays or set up a confidence monitor on stage for your presenter. You can customize which composition layers are visible on Program, Subprogram, and Aux using the Layer Settings submenu. This is helpful if you want Subprogram to be a clean version of Program without any overlays, or if you have a hybrid event with different composition layer needs for the in-house and the live stream feeds. Changing the output assignments is necessary to set up the Aux video output. For example, you have Camera 1 on Program assigned to the USB streaming output for your live stream, and you have a PowerPoint as the Aux assigned to an HDMI output for an in-house projector assuming your audience does not need to see the cameras on the projector. You can also assign any of the two multi-view types to a video output. There's a standard multi-view, which is what you see by default on the LCD screen, as well as still view for all of your still images. In the video input menu, you can adjust each of the HDMI inputs. The input status helps you troubleshoot the connection and see what its resolution and frame rate is. Below that are settings to flip the image and adjust how it looks. The HDMI inputs have additional settings, including EDID, which can be helpful for troubleshooting. Otherwise, leave it at its default internal setting. The scaler adjusts the size and position of the video source. This can be helpful with computers if you want to crop out the taskbar or dock. And below that are color correction settings. It's recommended to first adjust brightness, contrast, and saturation on the sources themselves, especially if it's a camera, before making any adjustments in the video input menu. In the video output menu, color space and signal type can be adjusted when troubleshooting compatibility issues with other equipment. Otherwise, use the default settings. Below that are settings to adjust how the output looks, as well as to enable record control over HDMI with compatible Atomos recorders. The USB output menu gives you the status of the connection for troubleshooting. It should say connected 3.0 for HD quality video when using a compatible cable. You can then use the VR6 HD with any software that supports USB video and audio, like Roland LiveStreamer, Roland Live Recorder, OBS Studio, Zoom, Teams, and more. You can also adjust the output format setting. If using Zoom or Teams, change it to YUI2 for best results. If your connection is unstable with YUI2, change this setting back to YUI2 and Motion JPEG. Other streaming and recording software can use either setting. And if you have any issues with your USB video connection, please visit our knowledge base for a list of compatible USB cables. There's a link in the description of this video. The reason for this is that not all USB-C cables support super speed data transfer. Some are designed only for charging devices. In the audio menus, you can mix and process audio from the analog inputs, each video input, as well as the USB streaming port and wirelessly with Bluetooth. Each source can be processed with effects like equalization and compression. Audio in 1 through 6 have settings for phantom power for using condenser microphones, and stereo link if you want to combine two inputs. This setting pans those inputs all the way to the left and right and gives you control of both using only one fader. 
input level adjusts the source in the audio mix. If it's a microphone, you first want to set the level using the analog gain setting for that audio source. In most cases, line level sources do not need any analog gain. And it's not recommended to use digital gain to boost a low signal, as that can add noise. Digital gain is typically used to match the audio level if the equalizer and compressor change the level noticeably. And if you're not using an HDMI source's audio, it's a good idea to mute that source. Also, if your HDMI source has more than two audio channels, you can select a different pair of channels to mix. Most sources only have audio on channels one and two, but this feature can come in handy by eliminating the need for an audio de-embedder box. Mono is helpful if an audio source is only on the left or right side when listening on headphones and you want to center it. And if you solo one or more sources, those are the only sources you will hear on headphones. So make sure to turn solo off when you're done using it. Effect presets are a great starting point with equalization and compression for different applications. And you can use delay to get individual sources in sync with the video. Every audio input source has a noise gate, compressor, and equalizer. Audio inputs 1 through 6 also have a de and audio inputs 1 and 2 add a voice changer, echo canceller, and anti-feedback. Let's take a look at how each effect can enhance your audio sources. The noise gate mutes the audio when it falls below the threshold level. Increasing the release time can make this effect sound more natural, but setting that value too high can make ambient noise noticeable. The compressor lowers the level of audio above the threshold level. The ratio determines the amount of reduction, which can function as a limiter when turned all the way up which is helpful for loud sources. The attack and release times are how long it takes the compressor to turn on and off once it crosses the threshold. Check the presets for ideas on which settings to use. Because the compressor lowers the levels of the source audio at times, you can also manually apply gain. The de is like a specialized compressor designed to reduce sibilance, S sounds in your mix that can be distracting for viewers. The high pass filter and equalizer adjust the levels of low, mid, and high frequencies. Use the high pass filter with voices that have a lot of low end, especially when using a dynamic microphone. You can drag the four dots to adjust the equalizer bands or tap a dot and use the settings above them. For the two mid bands, you can also adjust its Q factor to make the frequency adjustment wider or narrower. While the presets will work well for most applications, it's important to use your ears when adjusting these settings as you will likely need to adjust the threshold setting based on the audio source. If you adjust the audio effects and it sounds worse than before, Load the default effect preset for that source, as incorrect settings can add noise and distortion to your audio mix. The audio output menu has settings for three different audio mixes. Main output is your main mix. It has a compressor slash limiter, which can prevent loud audio from distorting, output delay for synchronizing audio to video, reverb, which is useful for music, and an equalizer for the entire mix. The aux mixes, which can be either linked to or separate from the aux video output, also have these settings. Main Mix also has loudness auto gain control for smoothing out mix levels and adaptive noise reduction to intelligently remove noise from a room. The audio follow menu is a helpful tool. Here, you can enable this for each individual source. The basic idea is if you can see it, you can hear it. When a video source appears on program, the source's embedded audio is heard until you no longer see it on program. You can also link the analog, USB, Bluetooth, and audio player sources to an input on the video switcher and the audio auto mixing menu gives you control over which audio sources are given priority by adjusting the weight setting. The higher the percentage, the more prominent the source is in the automated mix. You can also disable auto mixing on individual sources. The audio player has six pads you can use to play clips. Press the setup button to access the player setup. The player setup shows you the default sound effects and music files along with their properties. Tap a pad icon on the screen to adjust its settings. You can import a new sound effect from an SD card or USB flash drive. Then you can name it, adjust the level and fade times, and choose whether it repeats or plays only once. There are also four pad modes. With latch, pressing a pad starts the file and pressing again stops it. Pause is similar, except that when you start it again, it resumes at the point you stopped. Replay restarts playback each time you press the pad. And momentary stops as soon as you let go of the pad. The three playing modes are helpful for managing playback. BGM mode is for music so that only one song will play at a time. This is helpful if you have multiple music cues and you want a clean transition between songs. Just make sure to set up the fade times for each file if you want to crossfade the music. 
SC mode is for sound effects, allowing you to have multiple pads playing at the same time. And solo mode is for audio files where you want all other pads to stop playing when you start it. Now that we covered video and audio setup, let's move on to switching inputs. By default, if you press one of the switcher buttons, it'll switch to it using the currently selected panel operation setting. So if it's cut, the transition will happen instantly. If it's auto, the transition is either a mix dissolve or a wipe, depending on the transition setting. If you want to access all still images without assigning them the switcher buttons, press the monitor button until still view is selected and tap the still image you want to switch to. If you prefer to preview your next input before the transition, open the system menu and change the panel operation setting from dissolve to program slash preset. In this mode, pressing a switcher button sends that source to preview and the button turns green. To start the transition, press cut or auto each time you want to switch inputs and preview will swap with program. For this section, I will briefly change this window to aux video output. To switch the aux source, make sure the mode is set to aux and press the switcher button to change it. Note that the aux video output is cut switching only, it does not support mixed dissolves or wipes, but it does support composition layers. You can enable picture in picture and downstream key layers for the aux output in the layer settings menu. This can be helpful if you want to add a logo to both the program and aux outputs. There's also an option to link it to program. Otherwise, it'll appear on the aux output at all times when enabled in the layer settings menu. And if you want the aux output to be an identical copy of program at certain times, open the system menu and change the aux linked program setting to manual link. Now your aux video output is a copy of program, including all transitions and composition layers that are enabled for program. Pressing any aux source button will make it an independent aux output again. And when you press the currently selected aux source button, it will be linked again. The auto switching menu offers seven modes to automate your production. It can be as simple as custom timings or to a music source's tempo. You can also use it to switch between preset memory scenes or sources within a composition layer. You can have it switch in order or at random. And if you want to remove a source from auto switching, turn down its time setting until it's off. But the most versatile mode is video follows audio, where any audio source can control a video input. Scroll to the audio source you want to assign and choose the target input. Note that you cannot choose the actual video source or still image. It controls the actual button in the video switcher section and whatever is assigned to that button. The threshold is the audio level the source has to go over to trigger the switching. And there are three additional settings at the end. You can use audio mix target and audio silent target if you want your entire mix to control different inputs. For example, if you want to transition to your wide shot when no one is talking, you can set up the audio silent target to do that and the audio redetection time is how long it takes before it's ready to detect and switch again. Picture in Picture is a window on top of your full screen background video source. With the VR6 HD, they can be fully resized and cropped and can be even used with a green screen or graphic overlay. To start, Open the picture in picture slash DSK menu and select picture in picture one. Press the preview button and here I can adjust the size and position using the touch screen. Below that are additional settings, including source selection, transition time, cropping, and more. Note that you can use the video input buttons to change the source while in this menu. There are two picture in picture layers that have a fixed order. One is on the bottom and two is on top. If you want to duplicate or swap them, tap the copy slash swap button and choose an option. If you want to use the picture-in-picture -picture for a green screen or graphic overlay, change the picture-in-picture -picture type to chroma key. We'll cover keying later when I show you how to add graphics. When you're ready to bring the picture-in-picture -picture to program, press its program button. You can adjust the length of the mix transition using the time setting. You can also control this feature using the VR6 HD software for Windows, Mac, and iPad, adding flexibility to your workflow. You can find it on the Downloads tab of the product page or on the iPad App Store. We'll cover the RCS software and remote app in a future video. Now you may have noticed that the background source and picture-in-picture -picture window are switched independently. If you want to link them together so that your transitions will swap everything in preview with everything in program, turn on effects transition sync in the system menu. And if you only want to use this feature at certain times, you can set up a dashboard user button to turn that on and off. There's also a split screen mode, which you can enable by pressing the split button in the transition section. There are additional options in the transition menu to adjust the split type, center position, and border. When the split button is red, pressing a switcher button will select the source from the left or top side. And when it is green,
Pressing a switch or button will select the source for the right or bottom side. Note that the split mode will appear on both program and preview as a cut transition. You cannot use a mix or wipe transition with it. If you want to fade to a split screen layout, set up the two picture in picture windows to each take up half of the screen and switch to them using a scene memory or macro, both of which we will cover later. Next is the DSK or downstream keyer, which is used primarily to display graphics like someone's name, a logo, or any image where you want the background to be transparent and overlay it on top of your program video. Note that the downstream keyer layer is always on top of your picture in picture layers and your program source. In the downstream keyer menu, the default setting is self key. This means that you can use a luma key, which removes white or black, or chroma key, which removes a color. The default source is a still image containing a corner logo that says live. Turn the level and gain settings all the way down, and you'll see that the logo has a black background, which disappears when I turn up the level. For most graphics, start with increasing level until the target color disappears, and then fine tune with gain if needed. I will change this to an input with a slideshow of graphics I created. Here, you can see a limitation of Luma key. If I have a black background and black text, both are removed by the key effect. To get around this, I created graphics with green backgrounds because chroma key can be used with more than just green screens. Change the downstream keyer type to chroma. Note how nothing is happening when I adjust the settings. I need to change the color setting on page three from blue to green. Now I'm getting a good key when I adjust the level. If you're not getting good results, you can better match the key color using the sampling marker. Tap sampling marker mode and a small cross will appear on the screen. Tap an area of the image with the color you want to remove followed by tapping execute. Note how the hue and saturation settings are updated. This feature is especially important when setting up a green screen, saving you time with finding the best hue and saturation settings. You can also control this feature using the previously mentioned RCS software and remote app. I mentioned earlier that picture-in-picture -picture windows are also capable of Luma and Chroma Key. A great example of this is if you want to place a transparent graphic in the corner or resize it. Another is if you want a green screen camera shot of yourself in the corner while you present full screen content. And if your green screen does not fill the entire camera image, you can crop the picture in picture window and create a clean overlay. There are two additional keyer types available only with the downstream keyer. Note that they do not use the level or gain settings to adjust them. The first is alpha key mode. This will overlay a PNG format still image with alpha channel, which has the transparency built right into the file. No other still image formats are supported with this mode. For this section, I already imported a PNG format still image. We'll cover importing still images in the next section. Remember earlier how Luma Key was removing the text along with the background? With Alpha Channel, the image file has the transparency figured out beforehand, giving you a cleaner looking key without any color restrictions. To create compatible images, you will need image editing software like Photoshop to create them. The second is External Key. This is an advanced feature that requires compatible graphics software and two video inputs on the VR6 HD. Your graphics software may call it external key, alpha key, or key and fill. The computer will output two video signals of the same graphic. The actual graphic as you see it on the computer screen, and a black and white silhouette of that same graphic. On the VR6 HD, the key source is that silhouette, and the fill source is the actual graphic. Now, we use two still images for this demo, but alpha key mode is recommended for stills, as it only requires one image file. Here, no additional adjustments are needed. The silhouette acts as the alpha channel telling the keyer what to remove. This is the best way to key a sequence of complex graphics with detailed edges or animations with no color restrictions. The VR6 HD supports up to 16 still images stored internally. You can import still images from an SD card or USB flash drive using the still image menu. Or you can capture a still image from a live video input by selecting capture image in the video menu and following the steps on the LCD screen. When you load a still image, you will see a list of files on the SD card or USB flash drive. To import correctly, first format the drive in the VR6HD's SD card slash USB memory menu. A USB drive with 16 gigabytes or less is recommended. The image file needs to have a name of up to 64 letters and numbers without any spaces, and the format added to the end. .bmp for bitmap, .jpg for JPEG, and .png for PNG files. The image's pixel dimensions also need to match the system format setting on the VR6 HD. That means if the VR6 HD is set to 1080p or 1080i, the image needs to be 1920 by 1080 pixels, and if 720p, 1280 by 720. Note that software like Photoshop refers to these numbers as an image's dimensions, whereas video products typically consider them as an image's resolution. In Photoshop, resolution is typically the number of pixels per inch if you were to print an image on paper. 
As you have seen throughout this video, a still image can be assigned to a video input, a picture-in-picture -picture source, a downstream keyer source, or even an output fade source. And note that all input connectors and still images are active, so they do not need to be visible on the multi-view in order to use them with a picture-in-picture -picture or downstream keyer. Here you can see the bottom half of the multi-view only shows the sources mapped to switcher buttons 1 through 6. In addition to importing an image, you can save an image you captured to an SD card or USB flash drive, as well as delete imported still images individually. If you do not need your still images after using the VR6HD, you can disable Store to Internal Storage in the Still Image menu. The VR6HD can also import and playback video files. Open the Video Player menu to import files and make adjustments. You can also assign this menu to a user button. Here you will see the playback controls. You can also adjust the start and end times and enable looping. Tap the File Import button and choose a compatible video file from an SD card or USB flash drive. But before you play it, consider assigning the video player to a switcher button. You can also control this feature using the previously mentioned RCS software and remote app. Scene memories store and recall visual layouts and menu settings. Most of your settings are stored in a scene, so it's like a snapshot of your VR6 HD. One way to use this creatively is to create different picture-in-picture -picture layouts and switch between them with a single button press. To recall a scene, press the Scene Memory Mode button and the six switcher buttons below it will turn blue. If no scene is saved to any of these buttons, it will be unlit. Press any of the blue switcher buttons to recall that scene. Note that if you press an unlit scene button, it will load the default settings for the VR6 HD. But it's not the same as a factory reset, because only menus enabled and load parameter are affected, which we'll get into in a bit. To create or overwrite a scene, set up your program layout and configure your settings. Press and hold one of the six switcher buttons until they flash, confirming the scene was written. You can also add dissolve transitions to scene recalls by using the fade time setting in the scene memory setup menu. When it's set to zero seconds, it will cut instead of dissolving. If you set a fade time higher than that and recall a scene, it will dissolve out the picture in picture and downstream keyer layers, dissolve to the new scene's input, and dissolve the overlays back in. You can also choose which layers follow the fade time setting. In the scene memory menu, you can select up to 32 scenes. To see what's on program in each scene, tap the 2.8 view button on the LCD screen. You can also use this menu to name your scenes. If you change the name of any inputs, the changes will appear on this screen. You can also save, load, and delete scenes here. In addition to that, because you can use up to 32 scenes, there's a button assigned submenu where you can choose which scenes are assigned to the six switcher buttons. So when you create and edit them, you do not need them to be laid out in order. You can also control this feature using the previously mentioned RCS software and remote app. And to prevent certain groups of settings from changing with scene recalls, you can use the low parameter settings located further down the menu. You'll see that the audio settings are disabled by default. Note that when you store a scene, it still stores the settings that were turned off in low parameter. They just won't be recalled. Only the following menus are affected by scene recalls. Video assignments and input and output settings, transition menu, picture in picture, DSK settings, and for audio, audio assignments, input and output settings, audio follows video settings, as well as auto mixing. All other settings are treated at system level and can only be saved to a backup file on an SD card or USB flash drive. Macros are a list of commands that include switching between inputs, turning the downstream keyer on and off, audio adjustments, and much more. If you find yourself pressing several buttons to do a common task in your workflow, creating a macro will save you time and reduce mistakes. The VR6 HD can store up to 100 macros, and each macro can also recall scenes as well as other macros. Press the Macro Mode button and the six switcher buttons below it turn orange. If there isn't a macro in any of these slots, the button will be unlit. To run macros, press an orange switcher button or tap one in the macro menu. Remember to wait for the macro to finish before starting another macro, or you may interrupt the one that's in progress. Next, long tap a macro button and tap edit. There are 16 built-in macros, so I will select number 7. While I can manually add my steps to the macro, I can also tap the record button to save time. As you press buttons and move knobs, you will see your actions appear on the edit list. Note that the knob values are not recorded until you stop moving it. You can delete steps from the list while recording, and once you tap apply, they are saved to the macro. Each macro contains up to 10 steps and can take place either after or at the same time as the previous step. You can also copy and swap steps and name the macro. To test a macro while editing it, tap preview to watch it and decide if adjustments are needed. After the preview is complete, your settings will revert to how they were before running the macro. 
In addition to that, because you can use up to 100 macros, there's a button assigned submenu where you can choose which macros are assigned to the six switcher buttons, giving you added flexibility. You can also control this feature using the previously mentioned RCS software and remote app. The VR6 HD also has a sequencer mode, which lets you recall scenes, run macros, and even switch inputs from a list you set up beforehand. You can run the sequencer steps manually in order, or you can jump to a specific step, or you can automate the sequence to follow things that you set. To enter the sequencer mode, turn it on in the sequencer menu, then exit it. But before you start using it, tap the list edit button to add steps to the list and move or copy steps within the existing list. It's currently at the start of the sequence, and we can press the auto button to manually advance through the sequence, starting with demo macro one, followed by demo macro two. Notice that when I get to step two, the cut button lights up. This allows me to go to the previous step. I can also jump to a step in the sequencer by tapping the step and then tapping jump. Note that if you use the cut button or the jump function, it will cut to the end of that step. No animation or transition will be visible. When you press auto again to go to the next step, transitions will resume appearing as you move through your sequence. The network settings are used to stream directly, connect to PTZ cameras on a local network, and receive control commands from a third-party control system. You can also use RS-232 to receive control commands. When configuring the LAN settings for the first time, you need to create a four-character password in the menu. Next, you need to configure your IP address. If you want your network router to assign an IP address to the VR6HD, leave configure as using DHCP. If you want to assign a static IP address, change configure to manual and enter an IP address in the same range as your local network. And if you want to use tethering with your phone, connect it to the USB host port on the front side of the VR6HD and select Start Tethering. You can also use the priority setting to choose which connection is used first. With the default LAN setting, the phone would be the backup network. With everything configured, the VR6HD can now communicate with streaming servers and compatible devices on your local network. Now, with a wired network connection or tethered mobile device, the VR6HD can stream directly to any platform that supports RTMP. When you set up a service in the stream slash record menu, you can log directly into Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch using your account information, or set up a custom stream, which uses an RTMP URL and stream key from any platform. The video bitrate setting determines the quality of your live stream, and the VR6 HD takes this a step further by using an adaptive bitrate, which automatically adjusts itself during your production. If your internet connection is suddenly slow, the VR6 HD will temporarily reduce the bitrate to compensate, preventing the stream from pausing or skipping. Another way to conserve bandwidth is by adjusting the separate bitrate setting for audio. The setup menu is where you choose your streaming platform, and the Use Web Application setting gives you a QR code and a short URL to type into any web browser and enter your stream settings, saving you time. Now during your stream, if something unexpected happens that you don't want your audience to see, you can quickly display a safety still image assigned to a user button. You can find it in the stream slash record category in the user setup menu. This is used in combination with the stream delay setting, giving you time to interrupt the stream with the safety still image. And once things are back to normal, you can resume your stream with the delay intact. Also, when you start the stream, a trick to automate your introduction is to create a macro that will switch to a full screen graphic, play music, dissolve to your wide shot, stop that music, and then fade in a DSK logo in the corner. This is a great example of the automation tools that are available in the VR6 HD. You can also record with the VR6 HD directly to an SD card, even if you're not streaming. It will create an MP4 file recording of your audio and video using the stream's bitrate settings. You can enable this on the second page of the stream slash record setup menu. And if you want an additional copy of just the audio, you can create a WAV file recording in addition to the MP4. This is helpful if you're streaming a podcast and want an audio only version for upload. Once you're ready to stream and record, open the stream slash record menu or assign it to a dashboard user button and tap on air. You can connect up to six PTZ cameras to the VR6 HD and control them using the LCD screen. If you plan to use this feature a lot, assign it to a dashboard user button. You can also control this feature using the previously mentioned RCS software and remote app. Open the remote menu and select camera control. To add a camera, first choose the camera number along the top. The camera number does not need to match the HDMI input number. Next, tap setup. Here, choose the protocol for your camera's brand. If your camera's from Sony or it's not on the list, use Visca over IP. Now, enter the IP address of your camera, which can be found using software provided by the camera manufacturer or in the camera's on-screen menu. 
If possible, use static IP addresses with an unmanaged network switch to easily control cameras on a local network. If using a router with a DHCP server, which is necessary for direct streaming, you should reserve the camera IP addresses in your router settings so that they keep the same IP addresses when you power them on. Once connected, you will see controls to pan, tilt, and zoom the camera on page one and store and recall presets on page two. You can also recall a specific preset for all connected cameras by enabling all cameras load. If you want to recall different preset numbers for multiple cameras, create a macro that runs the recalls that you need. Footswitch control is a creative way to upgrade your workflow. Using footswitches and expression pedals from Roland's Boss line, you can control just about anything on the VR6 HD without even using your hands. For this overview, we will focus on the footswitches and show you how to set up the Boss FS6. Using a quarter inch balanced TRS cable, connect the compatible footswitch to the back of the VR6 HD, open the remote menu, and select CTL slash EXP. Let's edit CTL EXP1. Set the type to CTL for foot switches or EXP for expression pedals. The FS6 and FS7 each have two buttons, so they'll use both CTL A and B. Note that the FS5U will not control CTL A, it only uses CTL B. Next, you need to choose a category of commands. You can do things like recall a scene or macro, output a still image, or remotely press a button. I'll set this up to display picture in picture one on program. Now when I press the foot switch, it's just like pressing that button. You can also use a USB numeric keypad. In this menu, you'll see the same category and value assignments for each key on a standard numeric keypad. This allows you to add up to 16 commands to your workflow. There are some additional features and settings in the system menu worth mentioning. Panel lock can disable specific buttons and knobs on the VR6 HD, which is perfect for preventing accidental button presses. For example, if you only use switcher buttons one through four, you can disable the buttons for five and six, which reduces the risk of switching to an empty input. And if you end up needing those buttons later and forgot that you locked them, the menu button will flash when you try to use it, indicating the panel lock is enabled. There are additional settings in the system menu to customize the multi-view text and icons, output test signals, and reset all your settings to their default. More information is available in the reference menu. To update the firmware on your VR6 HD, go to proav.roland.com, click on streaming switchers under products, choose the VR6 HD, and scroll down a bit until you see downloads. On the list, click on System Program, also known as Firmware. This page contains detailed information on every update, as well as steps on how to update, with the download button at the bottom. A 16 gigabyte or less USB flash drive is recommended for the update. Connect it to the front of the VR6 HD and format it in the USB memory menu, if you have not already. Once the update is downloaded, unzip the update file and copy it to your USB flash drive. Make sure that the file is not in a folder on the USB flash drive. It needs to be in the main directory. Power off the VR6 HD, connect the USB flash drive, and hold Picture-in-Picture -picture 1 Preview, Monitor, and the Panel Setup buttons while you power it on again and wait for it to load the update menu. When it's time to run the update, the LCD screen will ask you to press Enter with the value knob. The update process is going to take a few minutes. When it's finished, the LCD screen will display complete. Please restart. Power the VR6 HD off and back on again. Note that the first time you turn it on after an update, it may take a bit longer to load. That concludes this complete video manual on the VR6 HD. We hope this video was helpful and showed you some new things to try. If you have any questions or you need support, please visit roland.com backstage, register your VR6 HD, and submit a support ticket. There are additional guides available on our website and knowledge base. The link to the VR6 HD quick start guide in the video description is a great place to start. Thank you for watching.